Well, hey there, and welcome back to Online Financial Foundations. In lesson number seven, we're gonna be talking all about taxes. How excited are you? Just kidding, I'm sure this is probably the lesson you've been dreading, but I promise I'm gonna break down the tax stuff and make it as simple and easily digestible as possible. And because this stuff is so important in your business, we're gonna get through it together and I'm gonna teach you some tricks for how you can make this a lot easier. So in this lesson, you're going to learn the types of taxes that businesses need to think about, the basics of those different taxes, and how to create a tax plan. Now, before we dive in, I want you to take a deep breath. Taxes are complex. I'm not just saying that to make you feel better. Literally, the U.S. tax code is one of the most complex tax codes in the entire world. So do not be hard on yourself if this feels hard. If this is not your zone of genius, consider getting help. Consider hiring an accountant to help guide you through this process. But even if you're not quite ready for that yet, I'm here and we're going to get through this together. So let's start by doing a quick overview of business taxes. In general, businesses can be taxed on three things, their income, their assets, and their sales. Now, Depending on where you're located, it does not necessarily mean that you will be taxed on all three, but these are the three general types of taxes. So here's just a list of the types of taxes we're going to review today. The first is income tax. That's the most obvious one. There's also self-employment tax, payroll tax if we've got employees, sales tax, and asset taxes. So let's go ahead and dive in and talk about income taxes. Now, if your business is a sole proprietor, an LLC, a partnership, or an S corporation, its profits are taxed at the individual owner or shareholder or partner level, meaning that even if the business makes the money, makes the profits, they do what we call roll up to your individual tax return, and that's where they get taxed. So they'll subsequently be taxed at the individual income tax rates. Now, multi-member LLCs, partnerships, and S-corporations do have to file their own tax return, but it's an informational return. So those entities aren't actually paying tax at the business level. Again, that's happening at the individual level, but they do have to file a return that discloses their income and their expenses and some other information for the tax year. Single member LLCs do not have this filing requirement. Now, in order to calculate your income tax liability, we first need to figure out what your taxable income is because your income tax liability is ultimately a percentage of that taxable income. And here in the US, the percentage that it is actually changes as your taxable income gets bigger. So first we start by calculating your business's taxable income. And the way we get there is we take your revenues and we subtract your tax deductible business expenses and that's how we get your taxable business income or TBI as I'm calling it. Then we have to aggregate your TBI, your business income, with your other items of income. So your wages, if you work in a job or if you have a spouse that works in a job or maybe other businesses you have that have income or just any other forms of income, interest, dividend, whatever it may be. That gets us our total taxable income. And then from that, we subtract out your personal deductions and credits. So this might be your standard deduction, it might be itemized deductions if you have home mortgage interest or property taxes or whatnot. But the important takeaway here is that when you are reporting profits from a business that is an LLC or a partnership or an S corporation or a sole proprietorship, that those profits get aggregated with all of your other types of income going on in your life. And we don't just look at the business on its own. Now, a few important notes about income tax for your business. So business income is reported on Schedule C or Schedule E of your Form 1040, depending on the type of entity it's coming from. And that form, as part of your larger Form 1040, is due April 15th for the prior year, unless, of course, that deadline has been extended by the IRS, which occasionally they will do if there is um, under extreme circumstances. For example, they did as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. There's also the ability to apply for a six month extension. It's a very short and easy form, but you have to file it by April 15th in order to get that extension. I do wanna just caveat here, really important point, just because you may be able to extend the, the deadline for 
your tax return does not extend your time to pay. So if you owe money, it is still due by April 15th. Now let's look at self-employment tax, which is the other tax that kind of gets folded in to this income tax filing conversation. So self-employment taxes are essentially the employer and employee portions of payroll taxes. So if you think back in the day to when you were an employee, if you ever were, you may remember that you had payroll taxes taken out of your paycheck, right? Well, that was the employee portion of payroll taxes. But you may not have been aware of this, your business owner, or your employer, the business owner also had to pay payroll taxes for you. That was the employer portion. Well, now that you're the business owner, you're responsible for both, yay. But don't worry, you actually get a deduction for the employer portion, so the tax hit isn't as bad as it sounded otherwise. Now, the self-employment tax rate is currently 15.3%, which is made up of 12.4% for Social Security and 2.9% for Medicare. And I do want to note that that 12.4% for Social Security is only up to the first $142,800 in wages for 2021. That number does go up every year. So now let's talk about quarterly estimated taxes, because this is one of those things that a lot of people get a lot of heartburn about, and a lot of business owners don't even know about. So I'm going to drop a truth bomb on you. Taxes aren't due on April 15th. What? They're actually due as you earn the income, meaning if I go out today and I earn $100, technically I owe taxes on that money right now. But the IRS has done us a solid and said, look, that would be really burdensome if we made you pay tax the minute you earned money. So instead, we're going to require you to pay in quarterly. A lot easier, right? So quarterly estimated tax payments are for both your income and your self-employment tax. So I want you to keep that in mind. And if you expect to owe at least $1,000 in taxes when you file your tax return in April, you are required to pay quarterly estimated tax payments. I wanna just say that again, make sure everyone gets that. If you expect to owe $1,000 when you file your tax return in April, you are required to pay quarterly estimated tax payments. So I've heard people say, I'm not required to pay them because I'm a sole proprietor, not true. I've heard people say I'm not required to pay them because it's my first year in business. Not true. If you expect to owe $1,000 or more when you file your tax return in April, you've got to make those quarterly tax payments. Now, when we're thinking about what we're going to owe, we also get to factor in all of the other taxes we've had with help. So, for example, if you have a side hustle for your business and if you also work full time as an employee somewhere, You've got all those taxes withheld from that paycheck, right? Remember, we're aggregating our income for the year, but we also get to aggregate the taxes we've had withheld. So you need to look at the whole picture and not just your business as a silo. Now, if you are going to owe quarterly estimated tax payments, those are due typically on April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, and January 15th. And as we go through each quarter, the way we calculate what we've got to pay is to determine our estimated tax liability for the year. So we basically look at what we've made so far, and then we annualize it. If it's the first quarter, we multiply it by four and figure out what we think we're going to owe in taxes for the whole year and then pay essentially a quarter of that. Now, you can avoid penalties by paying in based on the safe harbor rules. So what this means is if you get to April, and maybe you've been paying quarterly taxes, maybe you haven't, but you get to April and you haven't paid in enough money, you, you still owe in April. If you don't do anything, and if you haven't followed the safe harbor rules, you will owe penalties on that underpayment of tax. But you can avoid those penalties by paying in based on the safe harbor rules. And the safe harbor rules basically say that you will not get penalties on underpayment of taxes if you've paid in at least 100% of your prior year liability or 90% of your current year liability. And by the way, it's 110% of your prior year liability if your adjusted gross income is over a certain threshold, currently about $150,000. So this is a way to avoid paying penalties 
even if you're still going to owe money in April, and I want to make that point really clear, just because you follow the safe harbor rules and you get out of penalties doesn't get you out of paying that tax. You've still got to pay it. You just won't pay penalties on the fact that you paid it late. Now, I also want to note that your state may require quarterly estimated tax payments as well. Every state is different and their rules can vary as well. So even if they require quarterly estimated tax payments, they may have different rules about when those payments are due or um, what penalties you might incur or how to get out of penalties. So make, make sure you check not just the federal rules, but the state rules. All right, now let's go into an overview of payroll tax. So payroll tax gets paid for all of the employees of your business. So if you've got employees, listen up. If you don't have employees, you can skip a few minutes ahead in this video. Now, when we pay our payroll taxes as the employers, we are responsible for withholding both the employee and the employer por portion. Remember, I talked about the employee and employer por portion when I talked about self-employment tax. Well, when we're responsible for payroll taxes, that employee portion comes out of what we've paid them, but we also have to pay a portion in as well, right? And as the employer, we've got to get both of those amounts and pay them in to the either to the federal and state tax system. Now, generally payroll taxes are paid on a monthly or semi-weekly basis, but especially with the states, there are lots of different rules. And so you need to check what the requirements are for your specific business. And a lot of times those requirements differ depending on how much total taxes you're going to pay in. So that's why I say make sure you check the specific rules that are applicable to your business. Now, if you have employees, I highly recommend you use a payroll system like uh, Gusto or ADP. They will simplify this process, not only of paying your folks, but of also withholding the appropriate amount of taxes and paying them in to the tax system. Cannot recommend these enough. All right, so now let's look at sales tax. I'm gonna give you a very big warning here. Sales tax law is very complex and will absolutely make your head hurt. It makes my head hurt and I love this stuff. The rules for sales tax vary wildly by state. And honestly, they're ever changing because as business changes and especially online business comes into play more and more, states are like rushing, rushing, rushing to catch up on the rules because their laws in many cases are very outdated. So know that this is not only complex, but that the rules are changing every moment. So in general, sales tax could apply to products and services. Now we used to say that sales tax generally didn't apply to services, but I will tell you more and more states are charging sales tax on services. And a lot of states, while they may not charge sales tax on pure services on their own, may charge sales tax on services when coupled with products. So it's really important that you check the rules for the states in which you have nexus to make sure you understand what is subject to sales tax. And you might be sitting there going, "What? sorry, what was that word she just said, nexus? We're gonna talk about that, don't worry. Another thing to note about sales tax is that it's actually a tax of the buyer. So the buyer actually pays the sales tax, but the seller is responsible for collecting the sales tax from the buyer and then paying it up to the taxing authority. So while it's not technically a cost of your business, it is something that you absolutely have to pay attention to if you have sales tax liability. And lastly, I already mentioned this, but sales tax is based on where you have nexus. So if you don't have nexus in a particular place, you don't have to worry about sales tax there. And on the next slide, we're gonna talk about what I mean by nexus. So there are two types of nexus for the purposes of our conversation, physical nexus and economic nexus. Physical nexus is physical presence basically meaning you have some sort of physical presence in the state or in the jurisdiction. Now, you could have physical nexus through having an office or a storefront, but you could also have physical nexus if you have employees in the state or you have affiliates working for you in the state, or if you have payroll in the state or you own property from the business in the state, or if you perform services in the state, or, and lastly, this one catches a lot of people, if you attend trade shows or farmer's markets or some other type of selling event in the state, all of those things could potentially create physical nexus. Again, you've got to check each state's individual rules to see how they define physical nexus. There's also a concept called economic nexus. So economic nexus is when you have a financial presence in the state, either because you've sold above a certain revenue amount 
or because you've sold above a certain transaction amount. So a lot of times what I'll see is if you sell more than $100,000 into the state or more than 200 transactions into the state, just as examples. Now, not every state has economic nexus rules and the ones that do vary wildly again in terms of the revenue number, the transaction number, and some states only have one. They'll only have the revenue and not the transaction number. So here are the steps to determine if you have sales tax liability. First, determine where you have nexus. You almost certainly have nexus in the state where you physically work. That's where your business is, that's where you have physical presence. But do you have physical or economic nexus anywhere else? Once you've determined where you have nexus, then determine if what you sell is subject to sales tax in the places where you have nexus. You only have to look at the places where you have nexus. So number one, where do I have nexus? Number two, in those places is what I sell subject to sales tax. Again, sometimes if it's a service, it may not be. It might be if it's a service because it's coupled with a product, you have to look at the state's individual rules. And then once you determine, let's say you find out, okay, what I sell is subject to sales tax in that state, then you need to determine what rate to charge. And there are a lot of different rules on that I'm not going to go into in this lesson, but those are the steps to determine your sales tax liability. I just want to end with a couple of notes. Number one, you can have sales tax nexus in a state other than the state you work in. This is one of the biggest misconceptions about sales tax that I hear from folks is, well, I'm located in this state. So yeah, I have to worry about sales tax there, but I'm good everywhere else. And that's not true. Again, revisit the uh, physical and economic nexus slides. If you sell a certain amount to a state, you could have nexus there. If you have an affiliate in a state, you could have nexus there. If you have um, contractors working for you in a state, you could potentially have nexus there. So you potentially can have sales tax nexus in states other than the state you work in. Now, if you are subject to sales tax, I highly recommend using a tool like TaxJar or Quaderno, which collects and pays the state tax, uh, the sales tax for you. These tools are worth their monthly fee in gold because they handle this complicated process so that you don't have to worry about it. Okay, so our last type of tax we're going to talk about are the asset-based taxes. Now, not all of these will necessarily apply to us, especially as online business owners, but I do want to mention them just in case this comes up in your particular state. And I do want to say that these are typically state-level taxes or local jurisdiction-level taxes, not federal taxes. So a few that come to mind are an excise tax. This is typically a tax on the consumption or use of personal property, like cars or boats, for example. There's also property tax. If you're building, if you're building, if your business owns a building, uh, you may in fact have property tax you have to worry about for the business. And then another type of tax, and this is probably the most common that us online business owner folks may have to deal with is some kind of an asset or wealth or franchise tax. So a lot of states will tax your business based on essentially its, its assets, its worth, if you will. Um, and, sometimes, and so sometimes it's called a franchise tax, sometimes it's called like a wealth tax, and usually it's determined by looking at how many shares of the company you have outstanding or your total assets of the business. It's basically trying to figure out what's the, what's the worth of what you got and then they'll put a tax rate on that. So note that you may be subject to a tax like that in your particular state. So now that we've reviewed all of the different types of taxes, how do we pull it together and how do we make sure we don't miss all of these taxes and oh my goodness, I'm worried I'm gonna go to jail because I'm gonna forget one of these taxes. I hear that a lot. Well, my recommendation to you is to create a tax plan for your business. So what's a tax plan? Well. You're going to start by mapping out all of the different tax deadlines that apply to you and use this training to go through each type of tax and determine if you're subject to that tax at the federal level and in your particular state and map those out on your calendar. I personally keep mine just in my regular Google calendar in like I make it like a big red color so I can see it so I know when a deadline's coming up. You also want to figure out as part of your tax plan whether you're going to do those taxes yourself or you're going to have them done for you. And it may be a combination. For example, I have payroll in my business and I use Gusto for my payroll taxes, so they handle that. 
but you may also hire a, a CPA to do your income and self-employment taxes and those tax returns. You may use a tool like TaxJar or Cordero to do your sales tax. So figure out what that tax plan looks like. Who's gonna do that for you? Or are you gonna do it yourself? And if you're gonna do it yourself, what does the timing look like on that? So go back to that calendar and map out, okay, here's when I need to enter my information. Here's when I need to you know, follow up on any open questions or documents I need. Here's when I need to do my review. Here's when I wanna get it filed. And then lastly, include in your tax plan any tools or resources or documentation you're gonna need. Map out exactly where you're gonna keep stuff. What is your policy for receipts? Where are you gonna keep those receipts? Um, how are you gonna handle Form 1099s if you've got contractors? What is your process for that? Map it out and basically create an SOP, uh, a standard operating procedure to, to discuss how you're gonna handle the taxes in your business. Even if you are a one woman or a one man show, I promise you this is worthwhile because just having to go through this exercise is very valuable to make sure that you're not missing anything. And let me drop this final truth bomb on you for this lesson. There is no such thing as tax time. And yes, I'm even guilty of using this phrase in my business, but tax time isn't just April 15th. As business owners, we actually need to be thinking about taxes year round, sorry, not sorry. Because as I've noted in this lesson, there are many taxes that come up throughout the year, such as our uh, quarterly taxes, such as our payroll taxes. These are things we need to be thinking about. And I often tell my clients that the value of the work I do for them when I prepare their taxes isn't actually the tax returns because that's just filling out a bunch of forms based on stuff that's already happened. The value of what I provide them is actually the strategy and the planning that we do throughout the year to really maximize their tax situation. So if you're only letting yourself think about and focus on taxes in April, then you're missing out on the potential to save money, to get additional deductions, to structure uh, your business in a way that, that could maximize the benefits you receive, and to put processes and systems in place to collect all the information that you need to do this stuff correctly. So not having a tax plan is going to cost you time, money, and stress. I can almost guarantee it. So your action item for this lesson is to write out that tax plan and know that it's an ever-changing document and that's okay, but let's put pen to paper and get something written down now. In this lesson, you learned the types of business taxes, the basics of the different taxes, and how to create a tax plan. In the next lesson, you're going to learn what money meetings are and why you should add them to your regular routine. I'll see you there.